Welcome back to another edition of the Heart to Heart podcast. And my guest today is Erwin LaCour. So Erwin is the founder of MoveNet. And I'm going to let Erwin kind of uh, explain a little bit more about uh, MoveNet before we uh, get going. So Erwin, welcome to the show and just tell us a little bit about uh, MoveNet. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, MoveNet is a physical education program or even a fitness program that is very um, not typical because typically you would expect to, you know, lift weight and do kind of all kind of uh, drills like this. But the way we, we look at it is a simple question. How do wild animals become fit in the wild? And clearly they don't have access to gyms. And so what should we do? And how did our ancestors got fit so that they could survive in the wild too? And as a matter of fact, they did what I've been calling and I've coined as natural movement. So move that, it's a method for practicing natural movement and getting really, really good at it. And so you would ask me what's natural movement then again? <laughs> well, so what is the, the best way for, um, let's say a, a, a puma or a wild horse or a dolphin, you know, all these beautiful, nimble, strong, healthy animals in the wild to get fit? Well, they have to move the way their species enable them to move and ask them to move. And we can do the same. So let's look at kids, what they do when we were kids, for instance, we would uh, obviously uh, learn to walk and then we would run and we would balance, we would jump and land, we would hang and climb, we would lift and carry things and throw and catch things and do all these movements. Those are natural movement skills. So to become fit, you want to practice those skills. And as you practice those skills, you become fit. And that's the starting point, the movement skills. Um, Let's imagine, um, well, everybody knows that, for instance, you can learn to fight or to defend yourself in a jiu-jitsu academy or an MMA academy. And they are not looking at your body and telling you, well, you're not fit enough, go to the gym and come back and then we will teach you techniques. It's not how it works. It's the other way around. They say, you're welcome. Let's learn to how to use efficient techniques so that you can do those moves with efficiency. Um, and in the process, intensity goes up and in the process you become very fit for that specific task or movement. That's what we do with natural movement. So you've got to go through progressions. So you start, for instance, you're going to tell me, well, I can't jump and land just like that. It's dangerous. It's going to hurt my knees. Um, it's, you know, I'm going to be clumsy or something. Well, obviously, there are progressions to doing that. And same goes with climbing or lifting and carrying and, and all of that. But that's natural movement. And MoveNet is the program to learn that. Okay. So that gives us a pretty good uh, explanation. So my question then uh, becomes, Erwin, so say if you are you know, starting out, you, you want to get fit, then you would, um, you know, as, as I assume that you would, uh, you know, direct that person more to like body weight type of exercises and more like climbing and, uh, you know, activities like that, as opposed to say like weightlifting, is that right? Just because, you know, weightlifting is, I don't know if, if we can call it unnatural because you know we, we we are designed to to lift up heavy objects but you know certainly um you know when we're when we're weightlifting it's something that's artificial per se something that our ancestors didn't do as much whereas you know natural movement you know climbing um you know body weight exercises is something that our ancestors have always had access to you know, they've always had access to their their own body. So how do you sort of, you know, uh, take a beginner and, and how would you teach them to, to move? Yeah, so that's a uh, very good question. It's also a very interesting point. Um, and there is that difference between body weight or, you know, uh, resistance training, which means, you know, using weight or resistance to, to build muscles. But this is a, this is the conventional way to look at it. When it comes to natural movement, natural movement for humans, right? We're not trying to imitate a crocodile or a dolphin or a mountain lion. We are humans, so we want to move naturally as humans. 
and become fit in the process of exercising through the movements that belong to our species, human beings. Right? And therefore, we are very versatile. For instance, we can climb and we can swim. We may not be able to fly or to slither like a, like a, like a snake. Um, but there are so many movements that humans can do. For instance, uh, dolphins are amazing in the ocean, but they suck at jumping and landing on earth or climbing a tree or lifting anything uh, out of the water, right? Um, and a lot of animals that are land animals have problem doing anything in the water. We, human beings, are very versatile. So the question of body weight versus uh, using weight actually is not important. Why? Because we have locomotive abilities, which is the ability to move from point A to point B in a variety of environments. This would be considered body weight. And then we also have abilities of movement that are manipulative. The manipulation of external objects. We can pick, pick up things, lift them, carry them, throw them, catch them, uh, and basically manipulate external objects that they are light and in some cases heavy. So lifting or carrying, including heavy objects, is a natural human movement. It's a natural movement that belongs to the human species. However, I believe what you were talking about is basically the conventional in, it, it has to be said, artificial way to lift weight in a gym, which has to do with using machinery or using free weight, but trying to isolate specific muscles to work those muscles out. In MoveNet, we don't look at it that way. We don't try to isolate muscles. Okay. We, we practice the movement. We lift and carry specific object of a specific way on a specific terrain or in a specific way. There are different ways to use different techniques. For instance, what can you lift and carry? That can be a barbell. That can be a, uh, a water jug, a heavy water jug. That could be a human body, like somebody that you carry on your back in diverse ways. There's plenty of possibilities. We try and all of that. Okay. So, um, you know, my next question then would be that, you know, I know that there's probably some people listening to this who, you know, probably uh, do lift weights. And, you know, I would assume Good. that, <laughs> I would assume that, you know, you, you think that we should probably be doing, you know, body weight exercises uh, mostly, but um, like, do you think there's still some, um, yes. you know, there, there, there's some validity to doing say like compound movements, whether it's like, you know, like a farmer's carry, for example, yes. that people do with, with weights. Absolutely. You can do that just with dumbbells. You can do it with, you know, certain specific um, barbells that, that, that yes. have been created. Um, so, you know, I, and, and that's, you know, how I always tried to train with weights is try to use more compound type of movement so you know not doing i'm not saying i never do any you know bicep curls because you know we all know that you have to do a few curls for the girls right but um for, for the most part you know i do try to stick to mostly to to compound movement so you know when you're uh kind of teaching people you know if um how to uh lift weights or how to um you know practice natural movement you know do you direct them to you know more of like a farmer carry style type of workout as opposed to you know it sounds like as opposed to say like a classic you know bodybuilding workout yes absolutely so um before you learn uh, or you emphasize you you focus on like that manipulation that like moving manipulation of weights that are basically it's weight that external to you well and to have a strength or a skill to do that have you checked the ability your ability to move the way that you are. So compound movement is basically typically movements that are done on your feet, on your feet. And if you're going to move that it is running is a compound movement. Walking on all fours is a compound movement. If you look at a, a, a um, farmer's uh, walk, mm -hmm. what is it? It's walking with weight. That's it, yeah. Yes. So what is a kettlebell swing? It's a hip thrust, basically, which is either can be assimilated as a throwing movement or a catching movement. It's a compound movement 
that originally was designed for you to perform a practical task of lifting something or catching something, except that the device you're using, which is a wake, has a handle. Therefore, at the end of your effort, the wake doesn't is not thrown away. And you can keep repeating the same movement over and over instead of having to go and pick up the, the wake. So when you look at the movements you do from that scope of natural movement, you realize that originally everything is natural movement. In fact, any sports we do, any exercise we do is only possible because originally we have a body that's designed for natural movement. It makes sense that that would be the starting point in that, uh, well, okay, so you see a lot of people who go in the gym and like I said, it's great, it's much better than doing nothing. And strength is important. It's important for health. It's important for uh, neurology, for um, the, the state of your nervous um, system. It's important for self-confidence, important for a number of things. So I definitely encourage people to exercise and going to the gym is good that way. However, I would encourage them to go to switch towards more natural ways to, to do that. That's not just like, okay, count 10 on the left, 10 on the right. Now, okay, let's do the lats, let's do this and that, and thinking of the muscles you train, but more having more fun and more exploration in a practical way of like, how would I carry this load, that object from here to there? And could I do this without hurting my back, without stumbling, without being inefficient, without, uh, without being out of breath, without being stiff all over and all kinds of things, right? It changes everything when you look at it that way. So that would be my encouragement. Okay, so that kind of brings me then to, to, to my next question. So do you separate, you know, um, your your cardio and your strength training or do you combine them? As combine. One? What's that? Combine. Combine, okay. Most of the time, everything is going to combine. Um, okay. Why? Because the body physiologically and at a neurological level as well responds the most to specific kinds of stress. When you choose to exercise in any way, whichever the way is, you basically have an agreement with your conscious mind and with your neurology, the limbic brain, and, the, and that commands your whole body on undergoing a specific task that produces a specific time uh, kind of energy, kind of effort. The physiological response that we're looking at, you know, a, an improvement in strength, in power, uh, in, uh, you know, cellular respiration, cardiovascular response, whatever it is, is going to happen in the most specific way. So basically, if you train cardio on, on the one hand and strength on the other hand, it doesn't mean that you'll be actually ideally or optimally ready when all of a sudden you have to combine both. You okay. have to do something, some effort, some exertion that demands from you both strength and a cardio ability at the same time. And it creates a third demand, a different demand that you have to get specifically adapted for. So you have to wonder to what extent does a, a more specific adaptation, for instance, cardio on one hand, strength on the other hand, is going to actually lead to an ability of your body and your neurology to sustain an effort when both are combined. When you have to go fast with weight at the same time, you use your strength and at the same time you're out of breath. If you never train specifically for that, you are in trouble. The same way if you never train specifically for jumping and landing in a certain way on a certain kind of surface, anything that you don't train specifically, you're not ready for. General I, I conditioning you. may help a bit, but it only helps to a degree. And this is what I'm trying to, the message, very important message that I'm trying to convey. Yeah, there's there's one thing there that I think that um, you, you, kind, you kind of said that I agree with. And that's like, so I've, you know, played hockey most of my life. I do a lot of MMA right now. And, you know, the way that I kind of see it is that like, if you want to get good MMA cardio, mixed martial arts cardio, do a lot of mixed martial arts. If you want to get better hockey cardio, do a lot of hockey cardio. And yes. I'm not saying that like, you know, running on the treadmill is, is not going to translate into better results in those particular sports. But overall, it seems like, um, you know, people who uh, just practice their sport more often 
um, end up having the cardio that they need in their particular sport. Because like we were kind of, you know, talking uh, before the show or maybe at, at the start, you know, some people, you know, you may see um, in, in the gym and they, you know, they may not look like they're in the best shape. This is really popular in, in MMA and boxing, I find. And uh, like you look at like Tyson Fury, for example, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but yes. he, he, um, great champion. you know, he, he doesn't necessarily have like, you know, the, the ideal shredded uh, physique, but he has tremendous, tremendous cardio, you know, yeah. and, uh, and there's other examples of people like that. And I assume, and I mean, I haven't really looked at Tyson Fury's training, but he probably just boxes a ton and I'm sure he does do some, some, you know, strength training and some, you know, cardio specific um, movements, but for the most part, you know, I think that he's able, you know, to last seven, eight or 12 rounds sometimes um, because he just boxes a lot, you know, yeah. and, uh, and I find that that's a concept that um, maybe a lot of people have a hard time accepting and uh and they and sometimes they just don't believe it because they just because most people think that you know if i increase my time on the treadmill it's going to dramatically increase um you know how i perform in boxing or mma or, or cycling yeah. or whatever it is yes. but it's simply just not not the case is that what you've kind of found in your research and, and yes you're... absolutely um we talk about the set principle specific adaptation to impose demand so what are the uh, demands, the demands in terms of uh, physical response, something you have to do physically that you expect to have imposed on you? So let's talk about going to the gym. Typically, what's the end result that most people, and this is not a judgment, it's just an observation, most people uh, are looking at an improvement of their physique. So what they do in the gym is uh, mostly strength and a bit of cardio. And this is called strength and conditioning. It's the dichotomy between the body as producing force, strength, and producing a cardiovascular effort. So that's cellular respiration called conditioning. But they don't have a sport. Yeah. For the most part, for the most part, this is their sport. Basically, doing the strength and the conditioning to them is the is the the finality or um, the means to get to the finality, which is feeling stronger, being stronger to a degree or in some, some way and looking good and or looking better and feeling good about it. Yes. Okay. So in that case, how do you even do, you, how do you have any possibility of verifying in what way your strength and conditioning effort helps anything else? since you don't try to apply to another sport or to see and verify if it helps the practice of another sport. So in fact, it doesn't matter at all. It doesn't matter at all. So in the end, you end up, and I've seen that over and over, thinking that you fit and realizing that you may have the image of fitness, but you do not have a function. And so you end up in the water being clumsy and Gaining out of breath quickly, you end up out of the water, basically, um, and realizing, oh, wow, wow, I, I was not feeling that skilled or comfortable or strong or conditioned as a father would be. Why is that? Because what you went through physically that demanded a physical response from you has nothing to do with what you normally train. And therefore, you're not ready. It's better you're probably more ready than anybody else that never does anything that's for sure but you're not as ready as you think you are so because you think of the image you focus on the image you expect the improvement of the image and you also assume that the function is there too but then you realize soon and often that yeah the image is there but not the function or only to a, a limited degree and that's that can be that can be quite a revelation, you know, and can, that can be frustrating when you make that realization is that you're not ready physically. Yeah, I, I think that's, you know, the assumption of a lot of people and, you know, and I think I've been there uh, before as well. It was like, okay, if I can lift 
an insane amount of weight with, you know, whether it's, you know, bench press, deadlift, squat, whatever it is. And then I can also, you know, go on a treadmill and, you know, bang out a really good session, then I must be fit because I'm strong and, you know, yes. I have cardio. That's sort of the mentality of, of most people. But like you said, too, you know, a lot of those people, that's the only thing that they do is they just go to the gym. Not everybody, but, you know, particularly, you know, older people who aren't in athletics anymore. Um, you know, that, that's sort of the, um, the, the mindset that they have. You know, if I can get really yes. strong lifting weights and really good at cardio, then that means I'm fit and I can kind of do everything. But in reality, you need to combine, you know, all of it. And it kind of actually reminds me a lot of, um, you know, my, my main uh, mixed martial arts coach, Shia LaPriest, who's So I'm very, very lucky because when I train with him, we do boxing, kickboxing, wrestling, and jiu-jitsu in yeah. one workout. And no, when we no, spar, no. we don't, you know, just do kickboxing or just do jiu-jitsu. We do full MMA, right? So full yeah. MMA sparring. And I kind of see, you know, some kind of parallels there because, you know, people think that, you know, if I go to jiu-jitsu gym, if I go to a kickboxing gym, if I go to wrestling, then I know everything and I, and, you know, I know how to fight kind of thing. But it's like, unless you put all those things together, then, you know, you don't. Like, sure, you might know how to throw, you know, a double jab. Sure, you might know how to do a single leg takedown. Sure, you might, you know, you might know what to do in side control. But can you do a double jab, take the guy down with a single leg, then get inside control and then go for a choke all in a couple seconds, right? Yeah. And if you don't combine all of them, then you're never really going to be, uh, you know, a, a well-rounded fighter, and you're really not going to know um, what you're what what you're capable of. Exactly. You're not going to reach your limit. So you're with your coach, which is who is a smart coach. You're looking at two things. One is the effectiveness of what you train in a practical way. The goal is to become good at fighting or defending yourself. Okay, so that's what you look at. So you condition through the practice of the skills because the skills are what makes it effective, not just the strength or conditioning. And two, you verify it. You can verify that you become faster, sharper, more accurate. So there's, you have an instant gratification, an instant validation of where you're at. Yeah, this is, no this is the primary concern, right? Not what you look like. It doesn't matter what your body looks like. If you are a, a typical gym goer, and again, it's not a, it's just an observation. Typically, the expectation is, what am I going to look like as a result? The size and shape of my muscles. And maybe the, okay, well, that's my bench press. That's my total. Okay, cool. But you have to be honest with yourself that if this is your expectation, that's, you know, it's all that you get. Because for the most part, this kind of strength has very little application in the real life. I'll give you an example. Uh, you can bench press heavy. Good for you. It is an element of strength. Now, all of a sudden, you are in nature, in the wild, and you have to carry somebody on the wild terrain. And maybe you've lost your shoes, but hope, even if you do have your shoes. And now let's see if you have the strength, the stamina, and the skill to move a person one mile, person that maybe would be, uh, you know, 150, 200 pounds, not too heavy, but uh, maybe relatively heavy for that distance. Are you ready for that? Because the bench press that you do, it's a one single effort and that's it, you're done. And then you do five minutes cardio on the elliptical and then that's it, you're done. And it's all predictable. It's all in artificial, conventional, linear environments. Now you go outside and you're not ready for the chaos at all, unless you train it. Okay. So, so what you do is much closer to uh, what you train with uh, martial arts, much closer to a real life scenario than let's say somebody who do a, a kata, karate kata with, you know, nice kimono and everything and perfect <laughs> movements like this and like that. But in the end, does it translate to efficiency in the real life, in the real world? No, and everybody knows it. So it's a different, it's, it's a certain image, but there's little function there. So test the function, make a clear distinction. 
distinction in your own mind. Am I after the image only or mostly, or am I about the function? If I'm about the function, it has to be validated by checking out if what I try and for works in a relatively um, uh, realistic scenario. Okay. And if not, then talk about fit, being fit as something you look like, but not as something that you are, that in relation to things you can do with that fitness to help yourself, to help others in time of need, in one of the situations that demand a physical response from you. Do you have that kind of competency and uh, capacity and competency plus capacity together form what I call physical capability. You're capable in the real world, not just what you look like in front of a mirror. And I know that some people are going to be a bit hard with their feelings, but it's just an observation. It's, it's, it's on you to, to um, have those kind of considerations, to wake yeah. them, to wake, you know, what, what it means. Yeah, and, and I agree with you, particularly on, you know, like uh, the bench pressing or, and I'm, I'm certainly not knocking, you know, power lifters, like what they do no. is incredible. No. And, you know, Strong. it takes a lot of dedication, a lot Absolutely. of effort, you know, years and years to, to be able to lift some yes. weights. Yes. Lift. But you do have to, you know, understand that they're training one, two, maybe three, you know, there's basically three classic powerlifting movements, squat, bench, deadlift. Like they're basically training three specific movements. So they're getting better at those three movements. They're not getting better at anything else, you know? Yeah. And again, it's not a knock on those people. It's just an observation. So I agree with you there, but I think the big question that a lot of people probably want me to ask you is, Erwin is, so what exactly do you do for your training? Well, um, what I do exactly for my training, I have a um, very uh, versatile kind of training where I sometimes um, uh, do one or two activities uh, like running or and then swimming, uh, but that can be climbing and jumping, typically outside in nature. Um, and you may think, oh, well, well, this guy, you know, he's young and, you know, he probably, you know, I have kids, I have a job and everything. Well, mind you, you know, I'll be uh, 50 years old, uh, September 10th. Uh, I have three kids. I have two businesses, I'm writing a second book, uh, and I have an online coaching program. I'm a busy man, clearly. Um, so, you know, I'm busy. I'm working. and But I also have a life. Also, you know, it's organized. Some people go to the gym. My gym is outside. When I'm outside, I can run. I can move on all fours. I can... Uh, jump and land i can do balancing movements i can do all kind of movements and basically have an overall maintenance of my physical capability with all these skills because those are skills balancing is a skill jumping and landing is a skill running is a skill climbing is a skill lifting and carrying something is a skill and as i practice those skills i maintain the physical conditioning and the neurological adaptation also, not just physiological adaptation, which, by the way, neuro neurological adaptation is a physiological adaptation, by the way. Um, so that's the way I do it. And then I also have specific um, trainings. So, so where I just do one thing, for instance, breath holding or free diving. And uh, I have recently uh, broke a, the U.S. national record for static breath holding. Yeah, so I saw that six minutes and 46 seconds. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't a bad day, so I should have done better. Uh, but uh, so I have no excuse. But I was only you able to the record by like forty-two seconds or something. Uh, yeah, 40, 42, 44, Yeah, yeah. So you held your breath underwater for six minutes and forty-six seconds. Is that right? Well, it's very easy. Just you know, you 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 know, you start face down in the water. You're in a nice swimming pool. You just let yourself relax and float. You basically do nothing, which is the easiest thing to do. And you wait for the, you know, celebration cocktail. And that's it. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> pretty more, more seriously. By, by 44 seconds. Erwin, though, I, um, 
I know we only have uh, you know 15 or 20 minutes left. There's a couple um, topics that I wanted to uh, to cover with you, um, but just going, I want to talk about breathing in, in, in particular. But um, before um, we do that, just going back to your own workout. So do you basically work out six to seven days a week? Would you say? No, uh, I would say probably more like four days a week. Okay. Um, it depends. Sometimes it's going to be two times and sometimes it's going to be every day. Depends on my mood, depend, depends on uh, the circumstances, depends on, you know, how I feel about my body. I have a very, very acute and intuitive um, sense of my body and my neurology, which, which is that I know that when I need to, I can push myself. I know when I need to keep it easy. I don't need to do, uh, uh, you know, uh, HRV, um, heart rate variability or anything like that. You just have an innate sense of that because like I said, I'm going to be 50. I have many decades of, you know, busy being physically active in many diverse ways. I've done many different, different sports. I've done, of course, amateur level, but Olympic weightlifting, diverse martial arts, like Jiu Jitsu, uh, karate, uh, Thai boxing, you know, I've done, uh, only uh, this one I've said, uh, long distance, uh, uh, triathlon, I currently do free diving. I've done rock climbing, trail running, you know, uh, you name it. Plus, of course, uh, many, many years of natural movement, movement that training. So what would be uh, like a light day and what would be like uh, a hard day? Just kind of give us like a ballpark. Like, are you running like five miles and swimming, you know, half mile to one mile? Or like, what would like, like what, what, what do, do your days look like? Um, so, you know, my goal is to maintain a an overall baseline of physical capability, which to me is like, and I know I'm going to sound like a, a very arrogant person by just saying that, but to me, just like the minimum, the bare minimum, um, it's like I have a certain idea of what I need to be able to do, like in running and swimming and holding my breath and lifting, like a certain level of strength, certain level of skill, certain level of ability. And I regularly check that out, that I'm there. And that level is my minimum but it's just uh above pretty much everybody's physical level so that's why i said wait you're gonna tell me this guy is so arrogant i'm gonna i'm so ready to hate him but it's just the case this is why i've trained the special forces several times this is why i just it it doesn't matter because i have a way to train and that enables me to maintain that level very easily with little effort but i have done the hard work over and over and over and over in the past when i was younger so the amount of time and effort that it takes me today to maintain a certain level yeah is much less than for most people to get to that level does that make sense yeah for, for sure i mean you know i um you know i don't run like I mean, I run yeah. probably every second day or maybe sometimes a little bit more depending on how much yeah. I do. But like my sort of base run is about two and a half miles, which isn't really very much at all. But um, it's still, you know, a little bit more than... It's much more than most people. And also, you know what, Mike, is that maybe your running is not your forte or not what you have in mind to really increase at the moment. Why? Because you focus your energy on something else. So it's okay to have fortes and they're not really weaknesses. They're just aspects of physical capability that are not as as uh, as good as, for instance, currently your martial art level. Right. And it's OK. For instance, I'm going to train with some of those power lifters and they're going to just they're going to destroy me or with some runners or rock climbers they are going to destroy me. Everybody in one specialty is going to just be much stronger than me. But typically you'd be hard pressed to line up anyone that's going to be able to keep up with me in every aspect of real life physical capability that's going to be able to pass all the obstacles keep running jump land lift something hold their breath dive and do it again and again and again and again and again and again for hours if they have to i can do that okay even if i don't train for it why because there's a memory because i have the baseline uh training because i have the memory 
And because I have a neurology for it, I have the mindset and the neurology for it. So my body is ready to keep tapping and tapping and tapping into its resources, but that not because mind of a matter, but because of years and years and years of hard training. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you there. And I think I know what you're talking about just because, you know, and I, if I have like a hard, you know, workout that I'm doing in, in the middle of it, you know, I, I want to quit or whatever. I just think of all the other workouts I did when I didn't quit. And, you know, I basically have never quit a workout ever. You know, every time I've, I've, I've put something out there that I'm going to do, like if I say I'm going to run two miles, run two miles, or I say I'm going to run three miles, like that's it. Like, like that's, that, that's just getting done. And that's just, you know, again, like a mindset that, that I have. Um, but it's hard to cultivate that at first, because if you don't have that history of training, then you're not going to be able to rely on those hard moments. So I know that's, you know, difficult for people to listen to who, uh, who aren't, um, who aren't hard trained yet, but, you know, we all start, uh, the same, you know, we all start without the hard training and just have to, you know, do it and suck it up. And then eventually I know. we'll be able I know. To, to go back it, and, and have those moments and memories in your own mind where you, you were, you work out, you can think back, you know, absolutely. But, but um, I know we only have a few minutes left, and I thought we we're going to talk about breathing for the whole podcast. I'll invite me back next time, you know. 100%, 100%. But um, right now, uh, you know, like what um, exercises or what can you tell us about, you know, breathing that an athlete can do? Like, should we be training breathing specifically, like sitting down and training breathing? Or do you, do you breathe, um, like, do you have like specific exercises that you do or do you more or less just- We breathe? need a whole entire, uh, but uh, okay, real quick. Wow. Um, okay. Uh, there's ventilation and then there's cellular respiration, right? So you can manipulate the ventilation, but what you want to look at is what it does at the cellular respiration level. So the ultimate target is what it does at the cellular level you know, of respiration of mitochondria, of production of your energy. So exercises that you can do well, first off, 24-7, uh, you breathe through the nose, you breathe slowly, and you breathe gently. So you reduce the respiratory rate and the respiratory volume. A lot of people breathe through the mouth, not maybe not all the time, but most of the time. Like that. And then they breathe like with the chest, and the pace is too fast. It's like 15, 20, 25 times per minute. And that is terrible. Even in, in athletes that otherwise, you know, can run and they are fit and everything. But had, you know, you have basal metabolism, but you also have the basal metabolism or the basal cellular respiration, basically. Um, it's how well you oxygenate your body, the tissues. And knowing that basically you are not going to improve your oxygenation if, if you go like, <gasps> like that, right? Trying to breathe in more air is not going to give you more oxygen at a cellular level, cellular respiration. So what does that say? How can you actually improve the, you know, optimize the oxygenation of your tissues and especially your brain, especially the brain? How do you produce more uh, red blood cells in your bone marrow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you want to look at aspects of lifestyle. You want to look at the way you breathe 24 seven during the day and during the night. You need to understand how breathing works. And then there is the breath holding both static and dynamic exercises that you can do in their diverse ones on full lungs, on empty lungs with different physiological and neurological responses. You got to learn all of that. You can't just tell people just, you know, let say hyperventilate and then hold your breath and that's it. It's a one pony, you know, um, one trick uh, thing. It's, there's much, much more to that. And it's hard for me to describe in details, you know, what is the method, including the meditation, including, you know, working on self, emotional self-regulation and the state of your nervous system in real time as you hold your breath which is where it also is the real work starts it's like samurai like you need to quiet your mind which well, when you hold your breath for a prolonged amount of time you start to panic it alarms your limbic brain 
it creates a tons of a cascade of reactions where like people like get me out of here and if you can still the mind but you have to learn how okay so i know the you know the, there there's definitely ways where you can uh, you know do some of these breathing exercises that may increase your exercise or performance capacity but maybe even you know more importantly than that and, and maybe what you know more people uh, that are listening are interested in is you know it's also great for emotional regulation i think that's a, a beautiful term as well yes um, this is uh, what my current program uh, does is it's a lot about emotional self-regulation through yeah. breathful meditation i i love that term just because i feel like we could almost throw out the whole dsm-5 criteria for psychiatric dis uh, disorders and just call it emotional regulation you know that's basically what almost everything is like for sure you know depression ptsd anxiety are all different right. but at the mo at the at the core level it's all you know uh dealing with emotions that you know a lot of people don't want to deal yes. with well in the, D, in the dms5 you know you do have emotional these these regulations so um any a lot of issues that have to do with dms with anything you know psychological psychiatric or psychiatric has to do uh, it looks like it has to do with the you know the, the 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 thinking brain the conscious brain but actually it has mostly to do with the limbic brain and it's very hard to talk to the limbic brain because the limbic brain doesn't understand words that's not a language you'd understand and even if it you can trigger through thoughts and through uh through speech a reaction from your limbic brain it doesn't tell the limbic brain how to respond to that and then how to um you know reprocess all of that in a positive way this is what i'm working on through my system it's, it's uh, me, um to sort of interrupt there's there's a guy barry uh mcdonough he has um something called uh, the dare response i'm not sure if you've heard of it before but the, the way he, the dare response and basically you know uh what, what he's saying is that um if you're in like a, a panic mode what a lot of people do is they say you know don't get panicked don't get panicked just calm down and from my understanding the way he explains it is that that's just going to fire your amygdala even more yes. and in your prefrontal cortex which is you know your smart brain we'll call it is not being utilized mm -hmm. at all so <clears throat> when you uh breathe properly you know how to breathe properly like like you're coaching your clients to then what's happening then is it's shutting off that signal that's being sent to the limbic or the amygdala to keep firing and firing and then because um you know you're breathing properly then you're actually able to utilize your prefrontal cortex and it sort of shuts down that kind of panic response but if you just keep panicking and panicking and you tell yourself you know calm down calm down or breathe fast or whatever it is then it has very very limited impact because it's too late basically yeah, exactly. you cannot uh, you cannot access or adjust or modify or control your limbic brain in real time. Why? Because the limbic brain is a level of cerebral control or cognitive control of its own that bypasses the prefrontal cortex. So once you've, you've shifted, the prefrontal cortex is like trying to think and try to be like, calm down, calm down. It just doesn't work because you basically, you are throwing a tantrum. It just, right. it's the animal brain. It's the, the brain when we we're kids and we threw tantrums. It's very hard to regulate that, or you have to do it forcefully, would, or you have to be. It has to be done in a very soothing way, and um, by typically by some people that you can trust, right? And typically external. So to do it onto yourself in real time when you are at a limbic brain level of emotional dysregulation of emo emotional, um, you know, uh, behavior. It's extremely challenging. So it has to be done, uh, you know, upstream. You want to work on the limbic brain beforehand. You need to, to have things come up emotionally. And how do you have emotions, which have to, a lot to do with memory and memory of traumatic events, big, big or small? Um, how do you make them come up so that you can process them with your reason, with your ability to reason well, this is the challenge of every therapist. I'm, I'm bringing soon a new tool 
on the table, which is, which I'm working on, even though I'm not a theorist, but that's something we can talk about one of these days because I've, I've, um, I've just witnessed it on myself and on the number of people that, you know, uh, practice with me. So, so I know there's only uh, a, a few minutes left, but basically I think, you know, what, uh, people I think are, are need to realize is you need, first of all, you have to have a lot of self awareness and that if you let something go too long without being aware, then your limbic system is, is just going to go crazy. Your amygdala is going to go crazy. You're not going to be able to use your, your prefrontal cortex and you're going to be basically in a state of, of, of panic. Um, so before you know, the, is, of course, there's, you know, there's some ways to, to kind of get out of that state, but it's very, very difficult. So the easiest thing to do is to become aware of, of how you're breathing, become aware of these emotions, and then to try to stop them when they're first started, as opposed to, you know, when there's a little bit of, you know, dysregulation uh, or activity in the limbic system or your amygdala, and to kind of um, do something uh yes when you very first upper hand up 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 you know upstream because here you you know we're talking basically about the difference between uh psychophysiology and physiopsychology so uh physio uh, psychophysiology is how your mind is going to impact positively or negatively it's also could be called neurophysiology your um your 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 physical response um and so um and how can the, 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 the mind basically alter itself in a good way um, also. But then you have a person who does not breathe right. And we're talking about, well, you not mentioned that term yet, but over breathing. Basically a person who over breathes, a person like that can be fit, a looking fit, can be a runner and all of that, but they're over breather and what that means is that they're constantly because of a respiratory rate or volume that's too high they're lowering without their consciousness their levels of co2 blood level blood co2 levels what happens then is that they're in a mild state of alkalosis the blood ph what that means is that even though you breathe oxygen with every inhale the oxygen does circulate through your hundred or a uh, hundred thousand kilometers of uh you know uh, blood vessels the oxygen is there but, but then it's breathed out and you did not use as much as you need why because of the bore effect so you you flush too much co2 with every breath because you over breathe you breathe enough oxygen you breathe out too much co2 Therefore, at a cellular level, you cannot optimally use that oxygen that you breathe in. Therefore, you have a chronic deficiency in oxygenation. What does that, in what way does that impact your neurology, your limbic brain, the one that feels, not the one that thinks, the one that feels. It feels like, excuse me, this is giving me a ton of anxiety. <laughs> I like to breathe and breathing more <gasps> is not going to help because you don't have a problem with the amount of oxygen that you breathe. You have a problem with the amount of oxygen that you can actually use at a cellular level. And how do you fix that? You have to breathe slower through the nose, slowly and gently, and through the diaphragm too, but most importantly, slow breathing. Now, when people try to do that, first they have to think about it. It's a conscious effort. It's like a workout. Typically, they revert to their natural but suboptimal and inefficient breathing pattern of a breathing through the mouth. So it's not enough to do it even 10 minutes a day because the rest of the time, 24-7, you're not breathing right. So you keep not oxygenating your tissues the way they should be oxygenated and that creates anxiety that creates a, a an irritation of your the limbic brain so you're on edge 
Okay. Well, I think that's probably <laughs> a good place uh, to, to end. Our, that's a you know? very good uh, explanation. And uh, I'm sure a lot of people, you know, appreciate that. So, um, you know, thanks so much again for, for coming on. And, you know, if you can tell uh, people where they can find you online, where they can uh, purchase your, uh, your, your new breathing courses, you know, I'm sure that'd be appreciated. Yeah, thank you very much for asking. Well, when it comes to uh, to MoveNat, to training natural movement, then there is MoveNat.com. That's M-O-V-N-A-T.com. Um, and it's on NaturalMovement.com, which I currently uh, have in a live online program. So you go there, NaturalMovement.com. Uh, it's a live online program. Um, it's a four weeks program. And uh, I'm doing this uh, currently, I have already sold out the first two groups. The third group is about to be sold out. It's very, very successful. Uh, and, um, but that's while I am working on designing e-courses. So not, all, not a, a live program, just e-courses that, you know, you can learn this method, how to do it, what it does, the progressions, all of that. And I'm also writing a whole book about it. Amazing. Well, certainly uh, excited for, for your book to come out. And, uh, you know, thank you again so much for, for coming on. And I, uh, you know, I'd love to have you back on again sometime. And uh, again, you know, you've just Great pleasure, awesome. Mike. Thank you. And, uh, and shared so much information, both on, on movement and breathing. So thanks so much again, Erwin. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you.